everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Creating the Change from Campus uh, event. Uh, we are the Ryerson Leadership Lab team, and this is the second of our three orientation week events. Uh, we're excited to have you join us for the next hour or so to learn about our current work and how you can plug into leadership opportunities in the 2020 to 2021 school year. We welcome you and are excited to introduce you um, to our team. I'm going to quickly screen share the presentation for today, which we will also share with you after the uh, after the event. So bear with me while I pull that up. Before we begin our event, I just want to do a quick land acknowledgement. Toronto is in the Dish with One Spoon Treaty. Uh, the Dish with One Spoon is the treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and the Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the treaty and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship and respect. Um, and I know that uh, many of us, are, all of us are joining remotely in different parts uh, of Toronto um, and Ontario and beyond. So just want to acknowledge those territories as well. So let's meet the team. My name is my name is Fumita Kamali. I'm the manager of operations and special projects. Uh, I'm Bardisi. I'm the executive <laughs> director and co-founder. Hi, I'm Sam Andrew. I'm the director of policy and research. And I'm Braylon Guppy. I'm the marketing and communications lead. Uh, so we have prepared some questions. We will also use the chat uh, to moderate um, and get your questions. But the first one we will start off with. Uh, we'll ask Kareem Bardisi to talk a little bit about the Leadership Lab um, and some of the history. Um, thanks so much, Fumita, and thanks to everybody for uh, joining us today. I'm gonna t uh, end this little uh, section by telling you a bit about uh, what we do at the Leadership Lab. I'm gonna start by telling you a bit about me and where I come from and a bit of a window into the kind of work that we do from my story. Um, uh, I'm from, I'm not from Toronto uh, and my family's not from Toronto. I'm the son of immigrant physicians from England and Egypt who settled in Bathurst, New Brunswick in the uh, mid 1970s. Um, we were lucky to be welcomed to what was then a well-off resource town. It was half French, half English. Um, and despite our ethnic names and skin color, which for that town was uh, darker than anyone else in the town, uh, we were welcomed. Um, being of the majority religion there, which was Roman Catholic and having parents with jobs and, that the community depended on. They were both physicians, as I mentioned, definitely helped. Um, we were welcome, but we still felt dif dif we still felt different and still felt excluded. Um, I remember one day my mother coming home from after her shift as the staff doctor at the hospital and saying something like, they don't want to use the word patients anymore. They're calling them clients. And the administration just won't listen. They're cutting hours for care for the people who just come and rub the patient's feet. It's not right. That's what my, my mother reacted to what was happening at that institution of power. My father, uh, who was a pediatrician uh, taking care of uh, children, was less expressive and, and kept toiling away. Um, they both um, did a great service. They both sacrificed. They both um, were able to provide a, a good life for us. And they helped change a lot of individual lives, but they weren't able to change the system. Um, and they didn't really know how. They were there to do their job of, of being physicians. And um, when they left Egypt under the shadow of war in 1973, 74, uh, they didn't want to go and change the system. They just wanted a better life and to practice their life and to have a better life for their kids. Um, when my mother made this uh, comment around the patients and the hospital and the patients being called clients, I didn't have any good advice. And after all, I was only uh, 12 years old. <laughs> um, um, and, but what I knew is we didn't really know how to change things, even if we wanted to change things. Uh, in my town, it helped to be related to a teacher to play hockey or golf, some of or the, the majority sports at the time in my, in my town, um, to have power, uh, to, to be connected to people with power. Those were the things you kind of had to do. Um, at the same time, though, I could see from or far away that it was possible to exercise power. Um, uh, for me, I don't know if you want to stop the screen share for a moment just so I can continue this talk. Um, the, this is a, the time when the Toronto Blue Jays were a, a winning baseball team. The analogy today, of course, would be the Raptors. The Berlin Wall was coming down. People were talking optimistically about Canada. The sense of possibility was endless. And people were imagining uh, in the late 
1980s, uh, as the Cold War was en ending, how we could work together, how we could make big things happen, how we could work together as a country to do things like uh, bring an end to the apartheid regime in South Africa uh, and to bring opportunity to people who didn't have it. Um, and seeing those things on TV made me see that, you know, uh, big change was possible, that you could work at the system level uh, to make things happen. And that it wasn't just a faceless them that controlled things, but the them was uh, people you could connect with and influence and confront. And it's been that kind of realization, that passage in my career, which has been in politics, public policy, and journalism, uh, that brought me to this change-making endeavor. Um, and maybe it's that sense of possibility that inspires you uh, to this work, to see how we can use leadership, how we can use uh, the things that are happening in front of us, uh, how we can use policy change to make things happen. Uh, maybe that sense of possibility is why uh, you chose to go to university. Maybe that sense of possibility is why you're at Ryerson. And I know some of those things don't seem as hopeful as possible right now. Um, the events in the uh, United States and Wisconsin in the last 36 hours are uh, uh, just the latest manifestation of dramatic and deeply troubling things that we see uh, happening in our lives, um, things that we see happening on, on TV and online, uh, things that uh, we're experiencing in person. We might be experiencing moments of powerlessness. We might be experiencing moments of loneliness where others seem like they're in control of uh, the agenda. In fact, this very online event is a version of powerlessness because uh, outside forces are keeping us from meeting together in person. Um, we're also seeing uh, the rise of what you might call toxic authoritarian populism. Uh, people using their power not to include but to do the opposite, to exclude and to turn people against each other. And seeing that possibility was something that I saw uh, and many of us saw uh, years ago. And uh, that's what inspired the creation of the Ryerson Leadership Lab. Uh, that we can get literate about the issues, that we can understand how power works and start to use that power uh, in the circles that we're in. And um, so when I left uh, my uh, job uh, working for the Premier of, uh, then Premier of Ontario, Kathleen Wynne, in 2016, I decided with some others to help start this leadership institute under the, uh, under the uh, guidance and the request of President Mohammed Lashmi. President Lashmi wanted to help build up student leadership, wanted to help build up the capacity of young people to make change. And um, thus the Ryerson Leadership Lab was born, a realization that you need uh, to know how power works and you need to have knowledge about the issues if you're gonna make some change. Uh, and that's what we do at the Ryerson Leadership Lab. We're a multi-issue university-wide institute working at the intersection of leadership and public policy. And our intent is really to build up new leadership at all ages and stages, from students to senior executives to seniors to make progress on some of our most pressing public challenges. Um, to work on the outside, but then make our way inside uh, with institutions to help them make work better. Um, and to pull on a number of uh, skills, a number of abilities, whether you're artistically inclined, whether you're more inclined to protest, whether you're more inclined to be on the inside, um, whether you're more interested in management uh, or the arts uh, or uh, communications and design, uh, science, community services, um, uh, engineering and architectural sciences, any of those fields, any of those faculties. We want to plug you in, get you connected to the issues, and get you connected to each other, um, and get literate in power so that you can push open the doors that are open and push on the doors that are closed. Um, and that's what we try to do with some of the activities at the Leadership Lab. We've got a whole bunch of them, uh, and maybe uh, Famita, you can bring back the slideshow, uh, and I'll just take you briefly through some of the activities that we do at the Ryerson Leadership Lab. Um, and I believe the first slide that we're going to see, so we've got a number of, number of activities that try to meet this mission. Um, um, as I mentioned, we do uh, policy work, we develop leaders, and then we work out in the community um, uh, to bring new voices to this work and to hopefully help drive some solutions. Um, one of the things I just did before we go to the next slide, one of the things I just did is something that we, we teach a little bit of, uh, how to use your, your story how to use your experience to um, give an account of yourself. So it's not someone else saying uh, uh, what you're about, but you have the opportunity to learn how to, how to use the storytelling arts to really uh, tell your story. 
and use that towards uh, change in your community. So I'll just uh, start, I'll just uh, go through some of the activities here. Um, if you can go to the next slide, Mita. Um, so we have a bunch of, we have a few activities that are really in the public policy space. If you want to understand how um, uh, governments and institutions are making some of the major decisions, we have some uh, research and policy projects that do that. We've got a special interest in uh, anything related at the re relationship between technology and our society. Um, understanding how, how connected young people are uh, through technology and wanting to make sure that they're safe, that they're secure, that their privacy is ensured, uh, that facial recognition uh, software is not uh, disadvantaging them, that social media is a space uh, where people can come together rather than be driven apart. And so we've got the Cyber Secure Policy Exchange project um, uh, that we use to, to drive uh, uh, knowledge and work with governments to help drive change in that space. Um, since the pandemic, uh, we've all been kind of affected in that in different ways. I haven't told my story uh, about how I've been affected, uh, but I know through some of my conversations with students that there's been a real, real impact, whether it's just a fear to go outside, um, a concern from your parents or grandparents uh, that they don't want you uh, engaging out there in the world because of the fear, uh, people losing jobs, people getting sick and people yeah, dying. Uh, from uh, the pandemic. Um, we saw, we are not health people, but we do know something about policy and leadership. And so we created a project called First Policy Response to be just like their first responders in uh, uh, doctors, just like their first responders um, were paramedics in our health institutions. Well, maybe we can give the economic and social policy ideas that respond to that. So we've created a new project uh, to help respond to that. Uh, to, the, to the pandemic and we've, it's a new publishing platform where we're elevating voices, including voices that wouldn't ordinarily get heard to uh, respond to the pandemic. On the next slide, I'll talk about some other projects. Um, we're doing a number of things that are helping people come together and uh, organize around uh, our democracy. Um, we've started a new project with a group called Future Majority uh, that is all about uh, amplifying the voices of young Canadians and making, um, making them uh, issues on which uh, politicians have to respond. Um, uh, future majority works uh, in elections and between elections to uh, uh, drive youth voice and youth engagement on the issues that matter to youth and make sure that uh, elected officials hear those voices and respond. Um, and so if you're interested in any, uh, if you're interested in connecting with other youth, um, and or connecting with, with through us to get some of the issues that you uh, care about uh, identified, issues like climate change, uh, mental health, uh, cost of living, and where the future jobs are gonna come from. Uh, that's a project that you might be interested in connecting with us on. Uh, we host Canada's, we co-host Canada's largest uh, uh, democracy conference. And that's taking place uh, this year, October 13th and 15th, and we'll be, uh, uh, again, decision makers combined with people on the front lines, people with the, combined with people with the, the latest ideas on how our democracy needs to function. Another one of our projects, another opportunity for students to get involved as volunteers, as participants, uh, will be, th th this conference will be a pay what you can conference. If you decide to uh, take one of my classes or get involved with us in some other way, there'll be special ways that you can get involved uh, with us. Um, and on the next slide. Um, we have a, a project that um, takes uh, young people, um, and mostly Ryerson undergraduates, uh, to the United States uh, for a study trip. We've now done three study trips, two to Chicago and one to Washington, DC, to learn more about how, uh, how democracy works on the front lines in the United States, to learn from change makers uh, in their community in Chicago and Washington, DC. Um, we're not able to travel right now, as you know, but we're working on developing an online program uh, so you can meet uh, and engage with uh, people in power and people trying to make change in the United States, in Chicago and Washington, DC. Um, and that's part of a project that we're very excited about and it's a real leadership development opportunity. Um, at, at Ryerson, as an undergraduate, you know, you take your 12 week courses, uh, you might have the occasional uh, job placement, uh, but occasionally there are those opportunities to really supercharge your learning and connect with each other. And this project uh, is a really good example of that. Um, and then we have a new initiative that we've been uh, helping to lead called uh, the Coalition for St uh, Alternatives to Streaming and Education. Um, 
which is working to help in, uh, end the inequitable streaming of students in K-12 education. Uh, as you may know, in grade nine, there, um, if you get placed in the applied stream um, in high school, your chances of going to university are quite low. I hope that there's at least one student on this, uh, on this uh, uh, video meeting right now who might have gone through the applied stream and is still was able to go to university. Uh, that's something we need to end. We need to have as much learning taking as many people into college and university as possible. And so we're working on a project uh, with a number of other community members um, to uh, help solve that. And uh, uh, luckily uh, the provincial government has announced an intention to, to, end this, uh, to end this practice. And so we wanna work with them to make it, uh, um, to make uh, the, 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 new, the new practices as good as possible. Um, I'll also speak briefly, if you can go, if you can go to the next slide, um, I'll also speak, uh, sorry, one more, one more slide, if you don't mind, Fumita. Um, one uh, activity that um, is a sort of gateway activity to a lot of things that we do is uh, called, uh, is, a, is an undergraduate class. So uh, we teach a class through the Faculty of Arts called uh, Making the Future. The course code is SSH 505. I believe there's a waiting list for it right now, but there's an opportunity for uh, more students to enroll in it in the fall. I believe they're gonna be um, uh, admitting a few more students into that class. Uh, that's a leadership and policy learning class. In 12 weeks, we uh, take you through a number of learnings. This semester, we're gonna be focusing on uh, a, a number of aspects related to the pandemic and responses to the pandemic. Uh, we have regular uh, uh, guest speakers, people in power that you can engage with. Um, and I make it my, uh, my mission to, uh, I'm the, the teacher of that class. Uh, different members of the team have uh, helped teach that or be, been TAs for it in the past. And I make it my mission to get to know as many of the student, individual students as possible in that class uh, to help you connect with uh, the things that are going on in the world. This is a time of isolation and for us to be able to connect with each other, to learn how power works, and then to go off and make change um, through, uh, through learning um, and getting credit for it is a real opportunity. One of the things that's connected loosely to that class but that we offer more broadly is something called the Making the Future Fund. So if you've got a change making project that we think has some potential um, and um, it could be, a, a, there, we've had projects related to public transit, uh, improving public transit in Toronto, uh, in, uh, improving mental health and the connection that young people have with technology uh, and mobile technology, a number of projects that students come up with. Uh, we wanna support that and we have a fund that helps support that. Um, and that's, um, that, that's made more possible, I think, if you end up taking the, that Making the Future class, which is Thursdays, six to nine um, um, in the fall semester. So that's a, those are a number of things that we, we do and a bit of why we do it. Um, this is a time, again, of real isolation and a time when we can feel defeated and there might be things that are defeating you individually right now. We think it's our role to help uh, lift up the youth voice to help lift up those issues that we all care deeply about, whether it's climate change, the state of our democracy, uh, mental health, or where the jobs of the future are going to come from, and work with you to connect you with power, to connect you to each other, and to give you some of the tools, some of the learning uh, that you can really use to go out and succeed in the world. So that uh, whether it's uh, this month uh, or after graduation, uh, you have the ability and you have uh, resources in us, uh, the Ryerson Leadership Lab team, uh, to realize the change making uh, that you care about. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's all I have to say right now. Perfect. Thank you so much, Kareem, for your opening remarks and going through what the lab does. Hi, everyone. My name is Tamara. I'm the student engagement coordinator here at the lab. I just wanted to remind you that we're doing a giveaway to inspire your own change making initiatives here at the lab. So we've prepared a hundred dollar change making toolkit filled with tools to enable your own change making that include Desmond Cole's latest book, The Skins We Are In, which will be given away to someone who's super lucky here in this uh, the session today. Um, so just to move on to our panel, um, as you got introduced to our um, core staff earlier this, in the session, um, I'm just gonna post the questions now um, and go from this. Um, so the first question would be to our pro staff, um, what makes the Ryerson Leadership Lab unique to, unique? If anyone wants to take a stab at that, I think Sam unmuted himself. 
Sure, I can start. I think, um, so I went to the University of Waterloo uh, as an undergrad um, and there really was no opportunity or like structured uh, support system for people who wanted to do advocacy to, you know, make change in their communities, um, get involved in, you know, changing our laws, our public policy. Um, there was, you know, you could get involved through a political party and like political party groups, which is of course a great way if you're so partisanly inclined, but if you're more passionate about a particular issue or a particular cause, um, there wasn't that support system. And so I think that's what really makes Ryerson and the, and the Leadership Lab unique is it's an opportunity that, you know, whatever you're passionate about, uh, you can come to us, get supports, um, you know, take classes for credit or just, you know, do things um, in your own time, you know, through workshops and that, and that sort of thing to kind of hone your change making. You can apply for funding through the Making the Future Fund to support that if you need, you know, to pay for, you know, a website or, or, or um, you can even pay for some wages um, for your own time and that sort of thing. So, um, you know, it's a whole ecosystem of support for um, for you to sort of sharpen your leadership skills. And I think that that's, um, I think that's great. And it, if folks have questions, um, I don't know if we stress that enough. If folks have questions, feel free to throw it in the chat or, or raise your hand and we will uh, get to you. Perfect, thank you, Sam. Um, Braylon, Mita, would you like to add anything to Sam's remarks? I guess I can just agree that, sorry, sorry, Braylon. Um, <laughs> I did my undergraduate studies at the University of Toronto. And again, uh, agreeing with what Sam said, sometimes uh, when, you, when you're in a new university that's so large um, and you have your own interests specifically around policymaking or creating long-term lasting change through advocacy, I haven't seen this sort of work at any other university. So that is what makes the Ryerson Leadership Lab unique. And um, there are some great resources and, and folks that we can connect you with um, in lots of different advocacy areas if you're interested or in politics. Um, and I haven't seen that done at any other university. Yeah, and maybe I'll, I'll add on quickly. Uh, I guess I'm the anomaly. I did my undergrad at Ryerson. So I'm a very proud uh, alumni here. and. I feel like, especially when you enter university in your first year at Ryerson, was there was kind of an overwhelming amount of things to get involved with. There was so many opportunities that people continued to present you with for you to, for you to join the club or join the conference or join the initiative. And all of those are amazing opportunities, but there was always a way that you were, you were going directly into the mandate of the thing you were getting involved in. And to kind of go in with Sam is saying the mandate of the lab is to sharpen and encourage the things that you care about and the issues that you want to do. The mandate is actually the change making in itself. It's not you being part of the thing. It's you being the thing and, and actively creating a community of resources and people and other students that might care about the same things you do. Um, and that's a pretty unique thing uh, to kind of be, be the thing itself instead of joining the, the conference initiative or otherwise. And uh, that's what I really liked about the lab during my time at Ryerson. It's why I'm glad to be part of the, the team now that does it. Perfect. Um, so the next question will be um, for all of you, what has been one of the most uh, memorable experiences or one of the most memorable projects that you've worked on at your time during the lab? Oh, there's a lot. Um, uh, I, I will, uh, for the purposes of this group, uh, can I just, uh, um, we have, we, we've been able to create some pretty inspirational moments. Um, uh, somewhere in the, uh, in YouTube land, there is a video of our event with uh, uh, Al Gore and with Malala Yousafzai. Uh, so we'll, tr we'll find those and drop those into the chat. Um, having, having be able, being able to host and uh, celebrate these, um, Nobel Peace Prize uh, winning change makers and getting uh, close to some of the things that make them tick has been uh, very special. Um, and then on the other end, um, seeing some projects come to fruition that were only possible because of us, because of uh, something we do, I think uh, quite well, is bring together students from different perspectives and different faculties, um, especially in, in, in undergraduate curriculum. And so there's one project that launched recently that I have to check back in on actually uh, that uh, we're quite proud of, which was a uh, 
an athlete, um, an athlete video um, testimonial uh, where a, a group of students met in a class and they all had different experiences and they, brought, uh, they came together and realized that there was a, a story to tell around uh, abuse in a, amateur athletics. Um, and that um, was a very powerful story that they learned how to tell and learned how to translate through the class. And they only thought that this was a thing having met each other and realized that they shared uh, from four different faculties, shared an experience and wanted to use, the, in that case, their power of the story of, of, of athlete abuse to ho hopefully make some change. Those are a couple of examples. Um, Braylon, would you like to go next? Sure, I think that there are two. One is being part of the Can Study West trip to Chicago that we went on in February which feels like a lifetime ago before the world, uh, the world shut down. Um, but it was amazing. We took us to 20 uh, change makers from across Ryerson, Tamara being one of them, um, to, to Chicago for the weekend, learned about what does community activism and organizing look like in Chicago, a city that's built out of, out of community-driven change. And what does politics look like? It was a tumultuous time for politics, even in February, in the election year for the federal election that's happening in the states um, and it was really amazing to see kind of the the camaraderie and the the collective uh, change and excitement of the students that we brought and seeing how that kind of carried into their lives as they came back so going to Chicago was definitely a first one and the second one I can only echo Kareem's uh, I had a chance to TA the making the future course last semester uh, a course that I took when I was an undergrad here at Ryerson and so the giving back closing the giving back loop to uh, a course that gave so much to me when I was a student here at Ryerson and fundamentally pivoted how, how I see the rest of my career. Uh, it was a really wonderful thing and meeting incredible students that do amazing things uh, just out of, the, out of the sheer drive and desire to support their community and uh, things that they care about. And seeing those students is by far one of the best parts of, of, of working here at the lab. And we'll move on to you. Do you have any memorable experiences or projects you've worked on? Yeah, I have lots. I think maybe I'll pick up on one of the most recent ones, which uh, Kareem mentioned briefly, which was CASE, so the Coalition for Alternatives to Streaming in Education. And I think lots of people, um, you know, but especially uh, Black and Indigenous students have experiences of, you know, systemic racism in um, our school system and, uh, we sort of put up our hand uh, last year um, uh, to try to support this coalition, which is a, a kind of grassroots group of parents and educators and students who uh, wanted to make change and still want to make change to um, this kind of feature of our education system that, that requiring the choice between applied and academic courses. Um, and uh, to see most recently in um, July, the, the government um, kind of in response to some of the, the um, Black Lives Matter movement and, and uh, the George Floyd protests of, of recent months, um, they made a commitment to, to begin ending uh, streaming in grade nine uh, starting next September. And so um, that was kind of a proud moment to see that through uh, to fruition, but there's still lots of work to do on in terms of how to implement that um, change well. Um, and so if anybody on this uh, call wants to get involved with that, you can go to our website endstreaming.org and sign up to be a part of the coalition and um, get involved in, or, you know, sharing your story or just uh, working to make uh, change on that. Thanks. I forgot about that. That's my favorite thing too. <laughs> and then Amita to end things what has been your most memorable experience or project you've worked on? Um, I guess uh, echoing Braylon, one of the more memorable uh, projects, and there's so many, is the Can Study trip. Uh, it was really amazing to go on this trip with this um, really smart group of students and meet um, many inspirational individuals working in politics, advocacy, activism. Um, not only did we get to learn from these uh the speakers that we met with but i also learned a lot from the students who joined us on the trip um and i know that several of the students have created lasting friendships from that trip and and they're still uh, working together and have those relationships so that was really fulfilling and i'm so glad that we were able to do that before the pandemic 
and we're going to have more of those trips in the future. So look out for that. But also because of the pandemic, we're not able to go this fall. And so we're going to have some virtual programming, uh, some debate watching parties of the U.S. Uh, Trump Biden election uh, in October. So look out for those as well. I'm just, bringing, I'm, I'm just bringing up here an example of the schedule of what we did in Chicago on our first trip and put together these booklets. Here's, um, and then here's some the bios of the students. All right, go ahead, Braylon. No, I just, I love these screen share like moments that oh, in real time. Perfect. Thank you for uh, letting me do that, Tamara, for giving me that power. <laughs> <laughs> um, so before I move on to the question that was in the chat, we have uh, two more that I have in mind. So in your opinion, what has been some of the benefits of being part of the team at the Ryerson Leadership Lab? And I would start things off with Sam. Sure, I think um, maybe I don't want to um, belabor the point I raised earlier, but I think some of the benefits of getting involved are, yeah, these opportunities to get support for your projects, uh, both financial and sort of you know, mentorship ideas. Um, uh, and Daniel, we're going to get to your question about some resources um, for exactly that sort of thing in a second. And um, uh, I would say an opportunity to connect and make friends with some like like minded uh, folks as well. And then some cool opportunities to meet, um, you know, politicians, celebrities, things like that, where we help bring them to, to Ryerson and set up opportunities for students to um, to meet cool people and get inspired um, to become leaders in their own right. So um, yeah, those probably stand out to me. Mina, do you have any uh, benefits that you would probably add to Sam's point? Yeah, um, so uh, a few, I, could, I can give an anecdote. So a few months ago, there was a student um, that I kind of knew in the Ryerson community and I was telling them all about this uh, Kansas City US trip and why he should join us and he wasn't, convinced right away because he didn't really understand what the lab could offer him. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I maintained a relationship with the student and then there was an opportunity to send um, some of the, the students that we were connected with to an event where uh, former President Barack Obama was speaking. And when uh, this person went to the Obama event, they were able to meet other students and then really start to understand what the lab can offer if you are part of our community. Um, so connections, opportunities to go on, on trips, opportunities um, to get funding for your activities, not only through the Making the Future Fund, but um, for our Kansas City trip, there was a cost for some of the students to participate and through our connection and through our helping them, we were able to help them cover their portion um, to attend. So I think a lot of times when you hear us talk, uh, it's hard to make real what the benefits of joining um, the lab community are, but we're hoping to help you understand that by giving you examples of how we've helped students in the past um, and how they might have benefited. I'm sure uh, Kareem can talk to this, but there have been lots of students who, upon graduating, have been able to take advantage of uh, connections that they've made through the lab to get jobs, to get internship opportunities. Um, so yeah, there, there's a lot that we can offer. And just moving on to like adding on to Fumita's point, Kareem, do you want to add? Yeah, something? I mean, uh, Sam is a former colleague. Uh, Braylon and Fumita were former students. Tamara, you're a former student of mine. So um, uh, the, the, the being able to have relationships with uh, uh, students and people that continue um, to be able to build this work uh, together um, has been one of the best uh, parts of that. So I, I don't know, I don't know how many, especially for students, uh, we're looking to create things outside their program uh, or things that um, maybe they're not getting entirely through their program. I, 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 it feels like we're a good outlet for that. And Braylon, do you have anything else you want to add? Yeah, I think from the Making the Future class perspective too, there was, uh, there was one student that I think said it best one of the things that she learned from being in the class and from the lab is finding the things that you're passionate about and then turn that strength and then turning it into a way that you can help or ways that you can kind of create your change and from that she was I like to sing and then use created her use this acapella group that she used and that she's part of to create change for the homeless community um, and so when I think about that and 
I think the lab's greatest benefit is that it doesn't give you a set change meter that you need to meet within your change making. It gives you a platform and a place to discover it, to kind of find your find all these passions and meet all these other students that are passionate about things and then begin to think about, well, what am I passionate about? What am I good at? What are my strengths? Kind of doing that leadership development work that is a strong pillar of the lab and then connecting it as Kareem has mentioned before, connecting and plugging it into the different students, to different groups, to different resources that can help you kind of drive and sharpen and change those things without having a set, this is what change looks like at the pinnacle or this is what change looks like and looking at change is kind of a fluid spectrum uh, of different of, of different things and i think that's one of the biggest benefits is that it's a uh, there's creativity for, to kind of explore and find passion and change and sharpen uh, and plug into lots we of should, stuff we should drop in i can't find it right now but we should drop susanna's video into the chat as well yeah i can find it and please uh, please uh, type in more questions daniel we're getting to you in a moment but please uh, type in your questions or just raise your hand daniel we might want you to uh uh, show yourself if you're willing to do that uh, when you have to ask your question. So just before we move to Daniel's question, um, to give some the students perspective, what are some of the plans and how, what, how is the lab going to be supporting students this year with us going into a virtual semester? Kareem, you want to start? Yeah, so yeah I think I can speak to, to that on behalf of everybody. We'll be, uh, we've already moved uh, many of our programming online much of our programming online, our projects um, um, have, um, many of them have in connected to, uh, to, to uh, change to an online format. Uh, and we still try to gather people. So our Making the Future class um, will still gather in uh, online in, in, um, in small groups. Uh, our democracy conference, which is going online, we are going to try our hardest and our best to connect with community through that. Um, we have a commitment uh, to do a certain amount of mailing out <laughs> of, of material to the first uh, number of democracy exchange uh, attendees. Um, and I still have an outstanding commitment I need to honor around mailing some material to uh, students in the, in the spring semester class. Um, so we try to use uh, the mail, the phone, internet, and as soon as the, you know, and we're following Ryerson's guidance around uh, when and how to meet uh, in person. I'll say that uh, I'll probably be holding a certain number of uh, office hours um, uh, in person for those who are who are wanting uh, that um, in the fall semester, but I just haven't figured that out uh, myself yet. I think it's important uh, if people want to meet in person and are taking the appropriate precautions and are following the Ryerson policy on that, that we are able to do that. Does anyone else want to add to some of the ways that we're going to support students this semester? Good. Okay, so. Um, now we'll move into any questions um, the audience have. I know Daniel put his question in. Daniel, do you want to um, unmute yourself to say your question? Yeah, sure. So you guys mentioned earlier how your conferences can, can bring people together from different perspectives. Mm -hmm. And I find that one of the best ways to do that is to take all the bias that affects their opinions and just toss that aside and educate them properly mm -hmm. so people can find a common ground. So do you guys have resources to educate students effectively without bias? So um, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that in um, two ways. Um, so um, first, um, oops, wrong, wrong uh, tab. Let me just find the right tab here. So first we've got a couple of projects that are, um, that are, um, that are pretty uh, dispassionate or you know fact fact based projects in the in the spaces we care about. So I mentioned earlier this uh, first policy response, which is a response to the COVID pandemic, where we're uh, gathering the best ideas and publishing the best and latest thinking um, on um, on the pandemic. Uh, so this is a project that's really about this is I think becoming a one stop shop for a certain um, uh, a certain audience around. Uh, uh, around what are the best ideas to respond to the pandemic, and it's very it's very fact based. I would I would say though that there's always um, that there are always uh, multiple perspectives, <laughs> and that we uh, uh, I, we don't see it our, our as uh, our business as throwing out the bias. We see it our business as showing uh, people and connecting people and having people have an opportunity to uh, explore what those biases might be a bit more uh, deeply. 
but what we try to do is really uh, take from a, a broad perspective. Um, so a lot of organizations, for instance, politically, will either focus on you know left wing ideas or right wing ideas, uh, and only kind of drive people towards those perspectives. I think a lot of us on this group would be more progressive in nature, but um, as an example, our democracy exchange conference, we're going to be, um, uh, this website will change um, uh, soon enough, but uh, we're gonna be announcing soon uh, uh, guest speakers. And if you're interested in uh, the politics of, of ideas and where ideas come from, again, we're gonna be announcing one of uh, a, a very senior Republi uh, US Republican thinker <laughs> at the same time as uh, I think we're trying to de get Desmond Cole actually for that conference. So we try to bring a uh, uh, multiplicity of perspectives together. We also try to bring together people who might not know that they have, that their perspective is different. If you're, uh, Daniel, what, what uh, faculty are you in? I'm in accounting and finance. Accounting and finance, right? So in TRSM, and I've been, you know, we've been to the, I've been to the TRSM building and you've got the posters and you've got like, here's, here's, the, here's the speakers, here's the events. And that's really good. That gives you a good set of perspectives. Um, but I've seen in my classes when a TRSM student tries to use their language in conversation with an FCAT student, sometimes they don't even, they don't even use the same, uh, TRSM students and FCAT students might be using completely different words and they might not even understand them, might, might not even understand the shorthand. So what we try to do is try to uh, bring students together and bring ideas together in an environment where at least they can be uh, mutually understood. The other thing we do, or again, I'm speaking more as an instructor for this class, something I try to do a lot of is make sure people are going to authoritative sources because uh, you were asking about that. And so I make it a condition in my class that people are, are reading. Not these aren't unbiased sources, but they are more authoritative that we're sending them to some mainstream media sources so that they can get a baseline of understanding of, of some of the things that are actually happening. Thank you. Thanks, Kareem, for your answer. I think Nate has a question. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for running this session, by the way. I was just wondering, so I know that a lot of students, myself included, will not be on campus this semester because of the pandemic. Um, and it sounds like Ryerson's Leadership Lab is doing a lot um, and traditionally does a lot to help out like in the greater Toronto community, which is where Ryerson is. But I was wondering, as you're gonna gain participation from people in other communities, is the Leadership Lab going to focus on bringing those people into the issues and change-making events going on in Toronto, or are y'all going to be focusing on like providing resources for us to make change in our own communities as well? Uh, it's probably a, a bit of both. Um, so as an example of something that does a bit of combining Ryerson community members with non-Ryerson community members, we've uh, created a climate, uh, leader, climate change leadership training uh, program uh, that we've now developed, uh, delivered a few times. Um, and that has that, to Daniel's question earlier, that kind of develops people in a certain set of climate change, science, uh, policy, and activation, and then um, gives them the opportunity to connect with each other and to go off and, and, and run, uh, run projects that might be run by people in the community. Uh, our Making the Future class um, has a bias towards uh, uh, activation out in the community. Um, uh, but that, and then we run some of our own projects. So that case project, the, the end streaming project that Sam referred to is a project that we're helping to run where we, we have identified some uh, priority um, communities that we need to touch through that. So um, depending on the issue and your interest, um, it might be uh, more supporting your work or more local or it might be more uh, uh, bigger issue. The, the cybersecurity policy project that we mentioned earlier, that's a national, that's a national project. Um, where the work has to be national. Um, uh, 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 your security online in your community is going to be very similar to, uh, could be very similar to security online of someone else in a, in a neighboring community. And I would just add to, so we have a separate session tomorrow about the Making the Future Fund, but if you have a project in mind that's in your community, I don't know where you're from, but um, especially given the pandemic and everybody working online, we won't, it won't have to be a Toronto specific um, project that you apply for. Um, and so there's opportunities to make that more local depending, depending on what it is. Uh, and Nate, what, what faculty and year are you in? So I'm starting this in my first year and I'm in TRSM. I'm studying okay. business technology management. Okay, welcome. Yeah. And, and so there, 
as you as you've seen, and you might you you might uh, there might be people here who are recent high school graduates or people who have already been part of campaigns that started online or activities that started online that might have some uh, potential, and we want to support uh, those things uh, as well. Uh, who else? What else? Are there any other questions? So yeah, just to be to be clear about the things we care about versus the things we help you care about. We care about a certain number of things and we drive those issues around climate change, around education, around our democracy. Um, and um, each of the senior members of the team here, Famita, Braylon, uh, myself and Sam have connectedness into communities or into issues given our experiences uh, uh, in government and elsewhere that can be, uh, um, that help inform that or that might help in turn inform you in, some of the, in terms of some of the things that you might want to, to pursue. Uh, we know this is a very um, challenging time right now and we know a lot of people are hurting and a lot of people have questions about how, how can I connect, how can I connect and how can I make real the things that I wanna make real and how can I gain my understanding? Um, that's what a university is supposed to be about. <laughs> so what we're doing is just a, a microcosm of what uh, a, a university is already supposed to be about. And so maybe on the sidelines of learning, uh, the content uh, around accounting uh, or business technology uh, or fashion uh, or political science, um, we have this outlet that can help you uh, move some things that might be related to those things or might be unrelated to those things. More questions, okay. please. If there, we'll do one more, like a final call for questions. If not, then Mara, did you have any other questions you wanted to make things we you wanted to make sure we said? No, uh, the questions that I put forward were the ones that I had planned. Um, again, if there's anything, if there's anyone who has any last thoughts that they want to add, please feel free to unmute. I'm, I'm going to make a pitch again for our, for the course because the course is a good way into um, into that kind of learning um, that we've talked about. Um, and is a gateway into some of these other uh, streams of activity. Uh, so if you, uh, if you take the course, um, then you get to know um, some of these other areas of activity. And of course, you can also, also um, uh, connect in directly through the, um, through the newsletter. Uh, we have a student newsletter that we'll be adding you to so you can find out what's, what's going on with us. Um, Swad has a great question. Uh, yeah, <laughs> well, take the course, but also uh, can first year students take the course? Ah. So uh, here's a little secret. Here's something they don't tell you. Uh, can I say this, Braylon? No. If you really want to do something at Ryerson, then ask for, then say, I want to do the thing and ask, the, ask for permission. The rules will often conspire against you. Making the Future SSH 505 is an upper year liberal studies class. So it is um, intended for third and fourth year students. However, I've had first and second year students in the class before. And I believe what they do is they go to their department and say, please, I would like to take this course. Please, I have this thing that I would like to do. Um, the universities are, are large <laughs> and they have to have rules around how to run things. And so, but, but there's, there are often exceptions that can be made. Um, and if you, can't, if you end up not in the course for a reason, it doesn't mean you can't participate in our work. Uh, it just means, I mean, you frankly can audit the class. Um, um, you just don't get credit for it. Um, so there are lots of ways to connect into to, to material and curriculum. Again, taking the course officially is a, is, a, is a good way to do that. And we'll have lots of events uh, and workshops and things that uh, even if you don't take the class that once you get our newsletter, you'll uh, get notices about signing up for. But you have to, uh, to everybody in this, uh, now that we've done all this and we're adding you to the, to the newsletter, the next move is yours. So the next move is to take the course or to, to, to apply to Can Study or uh, to see anything that we've talked about that I want to be do that. Uh, you got to let us know in some way. Uh, Tamara, Adnan has a question. Yes, Adnan, if you want to uh, know you've mentioned you have a question about immigration and refugees, you can go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, so basically I came to this country, I think, three years ago, and I become through the process what we call as a refugee for asylum seekers. But then if you have never been to a refugee, there's actually a tank of process whereby you become asylum seeker, you wait to become a convention refugee, almost depending on how your case is or how the government process your application. 
But before you become a Confucian refugee, there's a case whereby students, they can't go to university because they will be charged as basically international student tuition fee. And actually, my case, thank God, I was approved and that is how I came rise and I'm actually going my second year. But my friend, his case didn't approve. And Ryerson is still there were charging him basically international student tuition fee. And I basically ask him this theory question, someone who is a refugee, someone who doesn't have basically nothing, how are they gonna afford to pay international fee depending on their status? So I would like to ask you, how can, uh, what are the things is leadership lab can help it to do basically refugees, those kind of students? So I would, um, so on this, um a couple things, what we would do in response to that is we would, that, so that's not an area of content specialization for us. As I said at the outset of our, my story, we think this, our work is really connected to having a, a good and deep understanding of the content as well as connection to the power structures. So what we would do there is we would uh, probably help refer you to uh, another entity at Ryerson that is a bit more cognizant, a uh, bit more aware of uh, some of these things. And um, we would use our platform, let you use our platform to the extent that you're interested in taking the course or organizing others uh, around this issue to then um, give you the space if you wanted to, again, primarily through our course to help organize on this issue if you think that there's some, uh, if there's some unfairness or some issue uh, that you want to tackle around international tuition, um, then uh, there's space and, 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 and guidance that we can give you around that. I don't have a, I don't have a particular answer to your question, unfortunately. Uh, and we're happy to take it offline and 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 to uh, to to connect you uh, to to some places that know a bit more about this this particular issues for sure. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. Okay, so looking at the time, uh, we have five minutes left, so I'm just going to wrap things up. So let me just get things. Can we get any, one more question in? If there are sure. any, if there's, there's any, always questions. a lot. There's always a question. <laughs> always comes in at the end. Um, and we're trying to uh, we're trying to do, uh, to, to Nate's question also we we are looking at having curriculum that is more uh, immediately accessible to first uh, first and second year students so you'll just have to kind of stay tuned for that but we're we don't have anything uh, for credit other than the uh, making the future class uh, Sam is also teaching I think well it's kind of uh, in your personal capacity a little bit but Sam teaches a um, a uh, government relations class at George Brown College. That uh, would be of. Uh, can you get credit for that, at Ryerson? No, Again, I don't ask. think so. I don't think so. But it's not that expensive. I think it's only like three hundred dollars because it's continuing education at a college level. Um, so if people want to take extra credit, uh, something to check out at George Brown. For sure. So one last call for any final questions before I go to the ending and announce our winner. Okay. I'll take the silence as a no. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me just present. So um, go, thank you so much to Kareem, Sam, Famita, Braylon for your continuous hard work and support through for students' uh, leadership. And to our audience today, thank you so much um, for coming out on this Wednesday afternoon. Um, we're gonna be asking, we have one more event happening tomorrow which is um, how to fund your change making, which is the Making the Future Fund info session. You can connect with all these lovely people here. Their, their emails are on the screen right now. Um, and you can also connect with us on social media at RU Lead Lab, um, on Twitter and Instagram. Our website is the ryersonleadlab.com, which is awesome. Um, we have two more kits giving, um, two kits to give away on our social media. So you can check our Instagram as the last date um, to enter is Friday the 28th. Um, to also consider joining us tomorrow for our event. Just so you know, to announce who won our pack today, it's Fiona Paul. We'll get in contact with you. So thank you so much for attending today. Like I said, um, at the beginning of the event, um, it was recorded. So in the next coming days, we'll have things posted. We want to thank you all for coming out today. And we hope that you stay um, safe physically and online and have a great afternoon. Okay, take care, everyone. <music>